Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Elkanen, and I have Reverend Emmanuel Lummelson on the line. He is founder and partner at the Lantern Foundation and chief investment officer at Lummelson Capital Management. He is having a pretty good October, or a pretty good year, so we're going to talk to him about some of his investments and investment strategies. Father, how are you doing this morning? Good, Joel. Thanks for inviting me on the show again. So happy to join you. Okay. I've had you on a couple times, and I don't think I've ever asked you about the Lantern Foundation and, uh, you know, what it does. Uh, that's a great question, Joel. Um, the Lantern Foundation it was established to support, really, uh, the ministries of the church, uh, specifically those related to the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople. Uh, and in that capacity... The thinking is that they're really, the church would benefit from having a, a conduit, if you will, here in the U.S., of uh, benefactors and donors uh, that they could give to, a 501c3, with that specific mission in mind. Uh, the church, as you know, uh, not just the Orthodox Church, but certainly Catholics, Protestants, uh, and other religious groups really are under attack from an increasingly secularized world, uh, atheism, and even more radical elements, like what we see going on with ISIS in Syria and Iraq. And uh, the foundation really helps to support education and to buttress the church, uh, even in Turkey, a country largely friendly to the U.S., uh, and in, in theory secular. Christians in that part of the world have come increasingly uh, under persecution. Uh, for example, the Orthodox minority there in Turkey, which once stood at, once stood at several hundred thousand, is just a couple thousand left. Um, the, one of the largest and most famous schools of theology, seminary, the, the theological school of Halki, on the Prince Island of Hebeli Adda, has been closed uh, since the 1970s under Turkish um, mandate. So I think in the West, um, people of faith, or people of goodwill who believe in religious freedom, uh, should be sensitive to these ideas, and the foundation is one way of supporting, supporting that cause globally. Great cause. Okay, let's. Um, before we get into some of your current holdings, uh, you announced a new position on uh, on Benzinga on October twenty first, and that's in Geospace Technologies G E O S, and it's up fourteen and a half percent since the announcement. Uh, what are you looking at in this company that uh, you know got on your radar? Sure, Joel. Uh, another great question. First of all, Geospace is just a great company. Um, they've got a very solid management team that's been together for a very long time. And uh, they're clearly an undisputed leader technologically in the uh, products they produce. But they're under the radar of a lot of people. They're a small company. And they have really been affected negatively with the downturn in oil prices. And I think that the general thinking is that there's a secular change in fossil fuels and in oil, and that's probably true. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen nearly as fast as most people think. Um, Renewables and so forth, and nuclear and other forms of natural gas will increasingly take market share probably from oil, but uh, that's going to take probably more than a couple decades to really have a material impact. When we were buying this stock, we bought about 2% of the company, we were really just buying it for just about tangible assets, and those tangible assets are probably understated on the balance sheet, particularly the company's real estate. Uh, in our meetings and discussions with uh, management there, we believe very strongly in them. Uh, they're an excellent example of first-rate management. And if you, you know, if you weren't going to buy the stock or if you were going to short or something, you'd have to believe that these guys were not going to get any more contracts ever. And I just don't see that happening. I mean, you'd have to believe there's going to be no more sales or there will be X units or underwater monitoring systems or their PRM systems or permanent well monitoring systems, which adds to the efficiency and output of wells. Um, but if you think there's even one more contract in the pipeline, this company is radically undervalued. Um, Again, trading just the tangible assets, really no, almost no entry for goodwill or intangibles, and a clear market leader. Uh, just to give you some idea, BP estimates that um, this year fossil fuels will still represent about 81% of energy as far out as 2035, compared with 86% in 2012. So really just a nominal decrease. And it's also estimated about $40 trillion will be required to satisfy energy needs through 2035. And uh, according to recent estimates from the International Aid, uh, Energy Agency, the biggest chunk of the $23 trillion will be for fossil fuel extraction, transport, and finishing. So, you know, if Geospace, again, as a market leader, just gets the very smallest percentage of that business in the next uh, couple of years, I think investors will do very well. 
that stock is probably 60 or 70 percent undervalued. Wow, that's substantial undervalue there. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, Kulik and Sofa. You were on the show on October 16th, and uh, if I recall, you said if you have to mortgage your grandmother's house to buy these shares, do it. And uh, I don't. I hope uh, you know grandmas out there aren't listening to this. But uh, it was a good call. The stock has uh, moved up since then. Are you are you still uh, sticking with your bullish thesis? Yeah, absolutely, Joel. And uh, I probably should apologize to all the grandmothers out there. You're right uh, for putting their houses in jeopardy. <laughs> but I, I don't think they would be actually. Um, we, we own about one percent of that company. And uh, back in April this year, we had led, written the letter to the CEO Bruno Gilmart pointing out a few reasons why we thought a share repurchase made sense. And uh, we were thrilled when uh, just a few months ago they, they heeded that call and announced a $100 million repurchase program. Uh, again, a company trading really very low multiples. You have to think that the business was going to go away sometime in the very near future if you thought the stock price was going to go down. When, when we spoke last time, it was trading in the mid-12s. I couldn't believe the price had been down that low. And now it's bounced back up into the 14s. But again, they're going to be a leader and this flip chip uh, advanced patching technology seems very, very clear. They're probably six to nine months out. If you study that balance sheet carefully, the way they're expensing R&D up front is actually overstating their expenses. So on the surface, the company, you know, properly looks like X. But if you look at the amortization of that R&D expense, once they get their first purchase orders for these advanced patching machines, their operating margins are actually much better than they appear. And um, there's a company bringing a huge amount of free cash flow every year. So they just got started on their share repurchase program. <clears throat> They only had uh, executed about 7% out of 100 million. I think, uh, you know, when the company's out there buying aggressively, as I'm sure they are, um, you know, you'd want to be an owner of that stock, is my thought. And you don't. Again, with the market. Yeah, go ahead. You don't like to have price targets, correct? You just kind of let the, the momentum of the markets kind of dictate what you're doing, being a long term investor? Well, we said in our letter to Bruno Gilmar that we thought that if they initiated a $250 million share repurchase program, the shares should trade at about 19 is what we put in our letter. Okay. They uh, initiate $100 million, but I don't think it would be out of the question for the kind of increase the size of that we purchased uh, in the next year or so. Okay. Our last yeah. interview, you talked about Apple, and you were very optimistic about uh, stock future. Boy, you had a good timing, uh, Father. You were on on October 16th. Just as the market bottom, but uh, you're, you're kind of, you were standing in the face of fear there, and you said revenues have increased, and it appears profits are going to increase, was your comment. And you said you're looking for some spare change to buy more shares. Now, this has been a tough one to buy on a pullback. Have you been able to get any more Apple stock, or are they just uh, they running, uh, running from your bids? You know, uh, Joel, we're always um... – Frankly, we're out of money all the time um, because we, we we have more ideas than money all the time than capital. And, uh, you know, really, I mean, we, <laughs> we would pay bar on steel to get more capital to buy those shares in the 90s, but uh, it wasn't in the cards. We still want a very large uh, stake in Apple. It's 20 million or something like that. And, uh, you know, we've got a huge return on it. I mean, something like 95% return with dividends in the last 18 months. So it's an unusual, I mean, I don't think that many times in a lifetime you can have an investment that quite that good where you're buying a world-class company with really never before seen history and history brand equity. Um, it was so widely misunderstood. But, you know, Tim Cook's on a recent conference call saying, look, we're selling everything we're making. Uh, they're selling more of the high margin on iPhone 6 Pluses. Uh, you know, there's not much more a company could do. I mean, they're, they're just hitting at the ball out of the park in every business they're in. And, uh, I mean, they've really almost ignited a whole new industry for, you know, paying this as well. It's I mean, they're, they're clearly the leader in that already uh, for a very small period of time, but I think they're broadening general awareness across the globe, and I think we're going to see them a leader in that space as well, and that's a huge market. So, um, you know, it's been a great investment. You know, glory be to God. And uh, you're not planning on dumping it anytime soon, huh? No. It pays a fairly large dividend for us uh, because we were buying at the equivalent of around $60 a share, or a little bit less than that, uh, pre, pre-split, around 400 so... I, I think there's, you know, there's only two reasons to sell stock goals, you know, and one of them is it's really overpriced uh, or if you have a better place to put the capital. And uh, it's hard to call Apple overpriced right now. And um, there's not that many better places to put your money because when you have a company that size and that well run with such a competent management team, um, you know, in terms of it doesn't have that much risk. It's not like buying, a, you know, some of these smaller companies where there's, there could be more unknown. So, no, we have no plans to sell. 
Okay, well, there hasn't been all green in your portfolio since we spoke last, and uh, we'll finish up with uh, two positions. Um, AEO, American Eagle Outfitters, is down about 5% five percent since we spoke last. Uh, has your outlook changed at all on this one? Oh, oh, no, yeah, well, in our last call, we actually mentioned we had sold AEO. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah, so we sold, um, if you listen to the October 16th interview, uh, we kept a very small stub position, like $5,000 or something, and, uh, in fact, the shares did go down. Okay. So, it was a very, very healthy return we made. Uh, I think we had that position for about eight or nine months. Not that long, but uh, That's it was a very short. large return for us. Okay. So we were very happy with that. And okay. I, don't, I don't think specialty retail is for everyone. I'll, I'll just repeat what I said last time. Probably uniquely risky for the average investor. Uh, so... Yeah, those things bounce around. And, uh, okay, and then, okay, WWE. Are you still, okay, I, I know there's yeah. there's got to be at least one rat in your portfolio there. WWE. Uh, now, that's taking no, a little still, bit of a haircut quite a, quite a, here. Reverend, what are you doing with this one? <laughs> well, no, we're still making, uh, we're still in the black quite a bit. I mean, we purchased um, in the 10s, uh, you'll remember, in 10 to 11 range. Uh, so we're still very much in the black. You know, it's it's really still the same story. It's been all along since back May when we made calls for the changes in management. And um, a lot of people took that to mean, I think, that we thought the McMahon Fund shouldn't be involved, and that's not true. Uh, when we talk about senior management, I, the problem with WWE is really it's a fiscal one. It's not a creative leadership problem, which the McMahon family does very well. And they'll probably always be involved. Um, but what you have is a business that does need change, and it needs new leadership or sell the company. And if you look at um, Vince McMahon's age, you know, he obviously cannot do this forever. And if you look at the next generation, they don't appear to be getting prepped to run the show, no pun intended. Um, so you have to ask yourself what's going through their mind. This is a billion-dollar enterprise. And it, its intrinsic value is probably far greater than you know, what it's trading at today in the right hands. You know, I think there's some legitimate questions that should be asked about uh, George Berrios' leadership as CFO. He's been very ambiguous in most conference calls. He really has not presented a good story that's been consistent over the years, and not just on the OCT network. These are all things we pointed out back in March in our original short thesis when the shares are trading at 31. But I think if you take a step back for a minute and you say, well, what's going to happen to the WWE? What's the future? There's no competitors. It still has an extraordinary mode. And really, I mean, maybe only, maybe not even second to Apple in terms of brand equity. I mean, if you look at WWE fans, they, they are extreme. So there's tremendous uh, intangibles there. Um, so our comment on the last show was it doesn't make a lot of shit sense to short it at 13, essentially. Uh, there had been some commentary on CNBC, uh, another fund manager came out and said his, his best idea was shorting WWE at 13. We thought that was odd, having shorted it at 31. Um, I think this is the time to be looking at WWE on the, WWE on the long run because something will have to happen sooner or later. And I, I do believe that the company has great value, even if the OTT network never realizes its subscriber rules, which it probably won't. And we've said that all along. But the underlying business still has great value. So I think it's a sound long-term investment. I think if you can buy it in between 8 and 11, there's probably a significant uh, and sufficient margin of safety. So you're looking at maybe looking to buy some more on this pullback, or are you happy with your position? <laughs> yeah, you know, we actually did. We, we did buy more when it pulled back. Okay. So, uh, all right. Yeah. All right. Well, that one, we'll look for that to, to turn around, keep an eye on it. A bad few days here, but uh, who knows? It can always bounce back. Uh, just want to, you know, get away. Oh, we forgot about LGND and uh, your short in that. Uh, <laughs> how, can I forget, yeah. how can I forget about your short in Legan <laughs> Pharmaceuticals? Did you get to cover anything down there at 45 or the change got below there or? You still sticking well, with your thesis that it's basically yeah. worth zero? You know, I'll give you. I'll answer all those questions, Joel. Um, we, we stick with our thesis. We think the company has no intrinsic value. Um, on our last uh, show, we basically said that investors will never see the earnings from the company. And shortly after the show, they reported their earnings, and sure enough, they're they're already very small earnings. We're eaten up in in large uh, stock awards to management, which is a theme that's been going on for years there. Um, this is not the kind of company where capital is being formed around a great enterprise that will, you know, like to last for many, many years and benefit society. This is really a wealth transfer operation. Now, that having been said, we are still short the stock, but only a very small amount now. 
um, much like AEO, uh, we've got this just a small stub short position. The majority of our position we covered around 43. So we made about 40% in about three and a half months. And, and the reason for that isn't that we don't believe it's still going to go down dramatically. I think that stock could easily continue to drop. It's just that <laughs> there's two reasons. One, we found better opportunities for the capital. There were less aggravation. Um, when you're sorting a company and you have an entrenched management team with a vested interest in making sure the share price rises, not necessarily that economic benefit comes to the common shareholder, there's really almost no limit to the creative ideas and the way that they'll word and craft their press releases to keep a certain number of people thinking they're holding a lottery ticket. And that's the type of investor Ligon is attracting. At the same time, people would buy a scratch ticket at a grocery store. They know the odds are stacked against them, but they can't help themselves. Meanwhile, of course, management's walking away with huge, huge incentive uh, bonuses and the form of stock awards that are diluting shareholders dramatically. But there comes a point where, you know, you say, it's a lot of aggravation. I mean, you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them I mean, we, just, we published six articles pointing out systematically facts about the company. No one has ever called one of those facts into question. I mean, they were all correct. Um, the stock, again, the stock lost 40% and just over three and a half months. I mean, it was extremely low. We had an, an enormous short position in the company. Our investors did very well. Um, I think I'd like to believe that we perhaps help protect other investors by pointing some of those things out. Um, but there's better opportunities to be on the long side. And we, as we said in the last interview, ideally we'd always be long. And when um, some other opportunities came along, such as Geospace, uh, we thought a better use of the capital was to, to buy into a great company where we really feel that we're partnered with management <clears throat> and management's really working for the shareholders versus fighting sort of the, this management team, which is really against shareholders, if you will. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, pretty good timing on that 43 entry. I see that uh, it only had a couple days to go down there. And I just want to, you know, we always talk about fundamentals with your father. But, I mean, sure. what what was your trigger at 43? Now, this is obviously revision history coming back from a trader. Sure. I go back to October of 2013, and I see a 43.20 low, uh, which was a yeah. major low in the stock. Is that but like your little technical analyst uh, on your right come up and tell you, hey, father, look at 43, or did it come from a higher source? Yeah, you know, Joel, I'm not smart enough to be a technical analyst, and I don't really understand those things. Maybe someday I'll, I'll, I'll figure them out. But, uh, you know, it really wasn't that. It was really just uh, in a moment of, of uh, reflection, just thinking, you know, how long do I want to keep publishing reports pointing out the absurdity of what this management team is doing? And as you know, short sellers, they get called all sorts of names, and there's all these ad hominem attacks that come along with it. And it, it's really paradoxical because you're, you're really trying to show the investing public how to protect their principal and avoid uh, losing it. Um, but certain people are really uh, entrenched in this sort of confirmation bias that they have, especially around pharmaceuticals, where they're, they're sort of got this light in their eye that they're going to get rich quick. And um, that, it takes a huge amount of energy, and I don't really think it's necessary. I mean, uh, it, it's so much easier to be long if you can find good longs. Good longs are hard to find in a rising market, but you know, Joel, it's really the grace of God uh, that the timing just came together that way. Uh, you know, we, we have no way of knowing that was really sort of effectively the bottom. It just turned out that way. Okay, well, if anybody's giving you a hard time, you let me know, and I'll uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll send my boys out after them. I don't want anybody giving uh, Father Lemelson a hard time. Okay, just bef <laughs> just before we let you go, just uh, sure. general thoughts on the market here. Uh, S and P futures uh, three ticks away from its all time high. Uh, Looks uh, strong, poised to uh, you know uh, post another all time closing high in today's session. If things stay the same. Uh, any, anything you want to alert um, our traders and investors to, just as far as uh, the overall market? Sure, Joel. Well, great question. Um, well, everyone should be very cautious. I mean, this market continues to rise, but nobody knows when it's going to decline again. And probably the biggest factor is um, these many years of QE. And QE, as you know, um, it's a devaluation in the currency, effectively. And nobody really knows, even the Federal Reserve Bank doesn't really know what the long-term effects on inflation will be. So stocks, um, they're inflationary assets. They rise in price. Nobody knows exactly how far up they're going to go. I think it can be frustrating to ask yourself constantly, when will the market go down? Maybe the better question is, where can I find particular securities that offer a significant margin of safety so I don't have to worry about the market, whether the market's going to go up or down? And I think if you do that, if you focus on that, you'll always sleep at night. And they're not going to be found often. I mean, I think if you can a couple great investing ideas a year, you're doing very, very well. 
the rest of the time, you have to be patient and you have to be willing to just sit on your capital. If you find capital is burning a hole in your pocket and you want to put it to work all the time, you may not be the best person to be allocating your capital. So far, that strategy, I mean, over the years, back even to 2011 or 2012, people were saying the market's getting overheated, it's going to pull back. You know, we didn't think about that. We just kept allocating capital to securities where we thought the intrinsic value was materially higher than the price. And the result is that since our launch in September 2012, uh, you know, we've returned a gross rate of return of 276%. Uh, and our net return, uh, net of all fees and expenses, is about 170%. So, you know, I think that's the best you can do. You can just say, where are the geospaces of the world? And if you look at so they've got huge amounts of cash, no debt, sound management teams, share repurchases, trading above, uh, just slightly above tangible assets, uh, or um, maybe assets that are understood, understood on the balance sheet. And I think that's the best you can do, Joel. Okay, uh, great words of advice from Father Emmanuel Lemelson, a uh, frequent uh, guest here on our show, providing great insights to the market. I hope we didn't keep you on too long. Thanks for being uh, one of my favorite guests, and uh, we hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks so much, Joel. I, I can't reiterate enough just how impressed I am with uh, your team and, and all Benzinga site. Uh, I mean, I, well, I wish we could invest in Benzinga, actually. <laughs> okay, so. uh, I'll get Jason on the line. No, okay. Now, that's a great compliment, especially coming from you. And uh, we'll be in touch again soon. All right. Take care, Joe. Okay. Bye-bye.